Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Paul Salem, Vice President for Policy and Research at the Middle East Institute. On behalf of the President and Board of Governors of MEI, I would like to welcome you all to this conference on countering violent extremism, local and global approaches. Uh, this conference is being organized jointly by the Middle East Institute and the Foundation for Strategic Research, Fondation pour la Recherche Stratégique in Paris, France, uh, represented uh, by uh, Professor Jean-Luc Marais, uh, whom we are very happy to have with us today. Violent extremism has been a scourge of humanity since the dawn of history, a dark passion that lurks in the human breast, arose in waves on and off throughout history, devastating societies, exterminating or enslaving entire populations. Indeed, the story of civilization is largely the story of countering violent extremism, establishing peace, moderation, and stability where once there was mayhem. And the struggle is still very much with us to this very day. Sometimes these dangerous waves take the form of fringe movements or networks. At other times, they succeed in establishing or taking control of states. The Nazi movement took over the German state in the 1930s. ISIS has just celebrated one, one year since the establishment of its so-called Islamic State over a vast territory comprising half of Syria and one-third of Iraq. As in the past, the threat from violent extremism rarely remains local. The threat is multiplied today by the mobility and porosity of today's globalized world. It is multiplied further when a movement of this type acquires the resources and durability of a state. The struggle against violent extremism is necessarily multi-tiered. It's a struggle against the violent extremist groups themselves as much as it is a struggle to prevent individuals from drifting into and joining such groups. It is a fight of blood and iron, but more importantly, a fight for hearts and for minds. It is local, but it is also regional and global in scope. We have assembled today an exceptional group of experts from Europe, the US, and the Middle East, practitioners, researchers, policymakers who are at the forefront of this vital struggle. This conference is the result of a year-long research project, but it is also an occasion to exchange views and lessons learned across a broad cross-section of countries and sectors. First, I would like to thank Professor Jean-Luc Marais, senior fellow at the Fondation pour la Recherche Stratégique. The foundation is the leading international security think tank in France, and without Professor Marais' vision and leadership, this collaborative project of research, policy work, and public communication would not have seen the light of day. I extend my thanks and appreciation also to my colleague, Dr. Gonul Toll, who led the effort at the Middle East Institute and worked closely with Dr. Murray and helped ensure that this project and this conference would be a signal success. And most importantly, I would like to thank the European Union and particularly the EU mission in Washington, D.C., represented today by Mr. Dennis Scheibe, deputy head of the political section of the mission, for providing the confidence and the financial support for this important project. Without them, this work, this conference, and the previous working conference, which was held in Paris last year, would not have been possible. The challenge of countering violent extremism is a collective one and without collaboration across nations, institutions, and sectors, progress cannot be achieved. I welcome you all again. I look forward to a stimulating and rewarding conference, and I cede the floor with gratitude and appreciation to Mr. Shaibi of the EU. Dennis. Thank you. Um, estimated colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of um, the EU head of delegation and Ambassador O'Sullivan, uh, I'd like to thank the Middle East Institute and the Foundation, Fondation pour la Recherche Scientifique, I got this accent right, uh, for setting up this conference and more generally for their efforts on the issue uh, of countering violent extremism. Um, when I arrived two years ago at the EU delegation, we had um, the first big uh, team assignment was to select the themes on which we would work with uh, US think tanks. 
And at that time, uh, the focus was not on Russia uh, and Ukraine, or not on nuclear negotiations with Iran, or not on the rise of ISIL in the Middle East. It was more about changes in Egypt, U-turn on strikes in Syria, or the Middle East peace process. Um, before going more on this testament to the expertise of foreign policy thinkers, um, I'd like to point out that although it's very hard to predict uh, tomorrow's challenge in foreign policy, um, everyone in our team agreed immediately that countering violent extremism was one of the, of the key themes we should work on. And, and if you look at the news today, be it uh, the result of the Gaza war investigation, the US presence in Iraq, uh, blogger flogging in Saudi Arabia, you will see that it's a threat that governs all our reflections in the major themes of foreign policy. Um, we agree in particularly, obviously, because of the security dimension. Uh, the security implications of countering violent extremism is, is huge, are huge for everyone in the US and in the EU, but with a, with a specificity for the EU. We have a large immigrants uh, population uh, who are at the heart of cities and who obviously um, have not managed to uh, integrate uh, in the best manner, and we haven't uh, done the policies to, uh, to do that. And the security dimension, therefore, is, is much more urgent for us than in other parts of the world. And uh, the, the different events that have taken place in the recent month show how urgent it is. Um, the second uh, issue for which um, this theme is so important was clearly spelled out um, in the 9-11 uh, Commission of Inquiry results, which defined the first threat, the security threat, as a stateless network of terrorism. But it also said the second danger, which is perhaps more important in the end, is the fact that there's a radicalization ideology which is gaining ground. And that was after 2001. And we're in 2015, and we can see that this danger uh, has been the greatest. Uh, the third reason why we um, in the EU focus particularly on that topic is that it has uh, been some sort of consequence of our work on opening economies and globalization um, of, of the world. We in the EU, we have just norms, rules, books, uh, endless discussions to open the world. And, and what we do is try to have values that can be acceptable to everyone, because if we manage to get an agreement at 28, we think that the world will, will agree to. Um, but globalization, um, creates a certain threat to identity, and we are not uh, oblivious, oblivious of that phenomenon. And that's why when we are working on globalization, we have to also working on, on countering extremism. And it's not extremism of, of one religion, it is a widespread phenomenon. Uh, you can relate to the Hindus' attacks uh, in 2002, or before coming to Washington, I dealt uh, intensively with humanitarian uh, crisis, and I went regularly to Myanmar. Who would have thought that Buddhists would be extremists? But Buddhists are, in Myanmar, uh, extremists in Rakhine state. So extremism is a fundamental phenomenon that we have to deal because it's the corollary of work we do on other spheres. And that's, that's really the, the key things. We are understanding the threat to identity, the changes. And that's why as soon as you work on identity, you have to look at what is the global impact of our policies and what is the local response. And that's why we are particularly happy with the title of this conference, which combines local and uh, global issues. In terms of uh, risks that we see in our work, um, the first one is how to combine our values and uh, good action. Uh, we have to have traction um, with uh, the people who are uh, interested in extremism, but at the same time we don't have to deny our value. How our action is fueling uh, extremism, how it is combating it. Sometimes it is clear to us that uh, if we appear as the international community, but it's basically an US-EU diktat, it will be counterproductive. Uh, we have different forms of legitimacy, different presence uh, in the region, and so therefore we have to be very articulate in the way we um, organize our joint efforts, and I think that this conference will be key in that. The way we deal with it pragmatically, first of all, we have a, a security strategy, which is an internal security strategy uh, in the EU, which relies on uh, sharing information much more between the member states and uh, third partners to intensify uh, police cooperation um, and boosting training and funding in all the endeavors. Um, the two things that seem to us crucial in the spread of radicalization at the moment are first the financing. 
the financing circuit, the means that are available to radical, radical uh, proponent is, is staggering, and we have not adapted to um, these new methods of raising funds. The second thing is the online community, the power of online, the power of the internet in giving identity. And it's not just the focus on Twitter or the petition to shut down the Facebook networks that are that. It, it's much wider. It's about video games being able to interact with widespread uh, categories of population in an interactive manner. It's about the values that are conveyed on, on the internet. And this is clearly one of the things where uh, the administration in Europe is lagging uh, in its reaction and not keeping uh, up to date. Um, that's for the security, the, 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 actually the easiest uh, way for the EU to tackle this. The more, the more difficult way is the prevention. And there, the first thing that is fundamental is the time dimension. Um, everyone, we are in democratic system, we have mandates of four, five years, we have to have results. But if you look at the rise of uh, extremism, you will see that you know, since 1990, 25 years, it has kept rising. And I don't think we are at the peak yet. But it would be illusory to think that the decrease will be much, much faster than the rise. So therefore, we have a time dimension that is very difficult to cope with as an administration with annual budgets, uh, perhaps multi-programming plan, but which are certainly not uh, commensurate with the fact that this is a generational problem. This is, it takes more than a generation perhaps to, to deal with it. And therefore, what we are doing in education uh, is looking at particular vulnerable uh, strata of populations. We're trying to empower women who are in, generally, uh, in general more, uh, have far more common sense uh, com uh, on radicalization. We're trying to involve uh, the private sector. I mentioned financing and online communities, so the banks and the telecom companies are particularly uh, things and we're looking at all the drivers being poverty, marginalization, government corruptions, everything that prevents an identity from emerging uh, in a state. So um, the other big strand of prevention is conflict solving. And um, if you're looking at what the EU does at the moment, it's trying desperately to support the UN process in Libya, uh, to support any possible negotiations in Syria. Uh, it is the, the it has a mandate to negotiate with Iran. What we're trying is to solve conflict because the conflicts when they have a, a foreign components are clearly a, a few. So without further ado, I, I'd like to just link all the, the things that uh, I just say to, to the panels. And I think that the three panels will be instrumental in feeding or, or, or reflection. We, as I said, we are sometimes uh, blurred by the fact that we have budget programming, uh, immediate outcome for uh, our ministers, and we need desperately uh, the expertise of people who can take the longer view. So for this, we are very happy to be part of this initiative. We are congratulating uh, the two organizations, and we look very much forward to the discussions. Thank you, Mr. Shaibi, for your remarks and for sharing your uh, views of the EU policy uh, in this field. I, I have the honor and privilege of introducing today's keynote speaker, Mr. Rand Beers. I can think of few people who can equal his expertise, his policy experience, and thoughtfulness in the field that is the subject of our conference. Uh, Mr. Beers served as acti acting secretary of the U.S. Department of Homeland Security in 2013. After that, he served as deputy homeland security advisor to the president. Uh, prior to that, as undersecretary at the Department of Homeland Security, he led integrated efforts to reduce the risks to physical, cyber, and communications infrastructure. He concurrently served as the counterterrorism coordinator, overseeing operational and policy functions to prevent, respond to, and mitigate threats to U.S. national secu security from acts of terrorism. Uh, he served on the NSC staff under four different pre presidents as Director for Counterterrorism and Counter-Narcotics, Director for Peacekeeping, Special Assistant and Senior Director for Intelligence, and Special Assistant to the President and Senior Director for Combating Terrorism. And capping this illustrious career, uh, he serves on the Board of Governors of the Middle East Institute. Uh, uh, we're thrilled and honored to have him with us today. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Beers to the podium. Thank you for that uh, kind introduction, and, and uh, let me say it's a pleasure to be here. 
uh, to open this important event, uh, uh, even if I were not a member of the board of directors <laughs> of the Middle East Institute, of which I am very, very proud. As I started to think about what I wanted to say today, a, a series of, of uh, very sad events <clears throat> came to mind. Um, Fort Hood, Texas, 2009. Times Square, New York City, 2010. Boston, 2013. Paris, last January. Madrid, 2004. London, 2005. But also Oklahoma City, 1995. Oslo and Utøya Island in Norway in 2011, and the Sikh Temple bombing in Oak Creek, Wisconsin in 2012. What's common here? Each involves citizens or residents of the country in which the events occurred. And that, I think, is what I would like to talk about most today. I then remembered my first uh, period uh, uh, in the post 9-11 environment in which I had to think about these issues when as part of the transition team uh, for the incoming Obama administration, uh, we were treated to a, uh, a briefing about the Somali-American community uh, in the emigration of some of its citizens back to Somalia to fight uh, Ethiopians, uh, but who were also, uh, according to the information available, uh, being radicalized by Al-Qaeda and raised concerns uh, that they might a return uh, to the United States to conduct terrorist acts. Um, this was really my first introduction uh, to dealing with domestic violent extremism in the post-9-11 uh, era. Um, as, has in, as has been indicated, terrorism uh, has been a political weapon for a long time and has been practiced by many groups. It's not the exclusive property of any national, religious, uh, ethnic, or any ideological group. Uh, in fact, in our own history, uh, at the beginning of the 21st century, President McKinley was assassinated by an anarchist terrorist. Uh, and we've had a series of acts uh, within this country uh, over that time. But in the 21st century, uh, I think the events of 9-11, the recent Charlie Hebdo massacre in Paris, and the massive flow of fighters to Syria uh, uh, and now Iraq, have in many ways come uh, to divine this problem despite, despite the horror of Anders Breivik's politically motivated mass murder uh, on Ataya Island uh, in Norway. What I'd like to do today is to sketch uh, some ideas for countering violent extremism. These ideas may also help uh, in dealing with other forms of mass violence such as the uh, attack by Adam Lanza at Sa Sandy Hook Elementary School, or the Virginia Tech su shooter, uh, Su Wei uh, Cho, um, uh, given the similarities of the behavioral patterns uh, that I think uh, were identified in each of those cases and in the other cases that I talked about. Domestically, the FBI and local law enforcement have shouldered much of the burden uh, on prevention uh, against violent extremism, and I think they have a very solid record using intelligence and law enforcement investigative techniques to prevent a number of such acts. Their continued effort in this regard is essential, but I also think just as drug enforcement agents have come to acknowledge that law enforcement is only a partial solution uh, to dealing with the drug problem uh, and that a more holistic strategy is required that involves demand reduction and public awareness efforts. I think as that has been recognized uh, in, the, in the drug enforcement area, I think also uh, that law enforcement counterterrorist experts uh, have come to see the need for a much broader community effort that seeks to identify violence-prone individuals before violence occurs uh, and to redirect them uh, into socially uh, productive endeavors. Is this pie in the sky or romantic naivete? I don't think so. The President of the United States didn't think so. The organizers of the White House Summit on Countering Violent Extremism uh, didn't think so. 
And as in the drug context, the paradigm is shifting, and Washington and many governments around the globe are moving to a model that prioritizes a different sort of prevention uh, uh, and intervention ahead of possible law enforcement uh, investigations and arrests. The heart of this effort, based on existing social science research, begins from the assumption that individuals headed toward radicalization and violent extremism generally exhibit behavior that foreshadows their inclination, whether it's self-isolation, uh, an interest in violence, uh, or violent games, strongly held grievances. That list, as developed by social science, goes on uh, from there and remains uh, an area uh, of further investigation. And while it is important also to remember that exhibition of these particular uh, characteristics does not automatically mean uh, that the individual is directed, uh, is, is directing him or herself toward violent acts, uh, I still believe that the point uh, remains valid uh, and leads to the second core assumption uh, uh, in terms of moving forward in this effort. And that assumption is that this behavior is observable by other people, by family members, by peers, by authority uh, figures like religious leaders or medical, especially mental health professionals. If you look at the history of the Boston Marathon case, in each of those areas, there was someone who saw one or the other of those two brothers exhibiting those kinds of characteristic behaviors. But none of them were reported. So from that starting point, how does society mobilize those kinds of, of observers to connect with institutions that can intervene and redirect and prevent. And this leads to the core element, of the central element of our national strategy here in the United States. Prevention of, uh, excuse me, pre-violence observation, identification, uh, and intervention are most likely to occur on the community level, and that is where society needs to focus the heart of its efforts. To that end, I'd like to talk about four pilot programs uh, that uh, are occurring around the United States in Los Angeles, Minneapolis, St. Paul, Boston, and Montgomery County, Maryland, uh, here in the nation's capital area. Each of these efforts combines local government and police with community NGOs, faith-based groups, academic institutions, and community medical and social services into a multidisciplinary approach. Each seeks to create community awareness of potential causes of and the signs of early stage radicalization. To uh, distribute knowledge of how and where to easily seek counseling and intervention and various types of inter intervention. In each, the intervention default is not law enforcement, although it always remains an option. Each has an acknowledged convener, but each is organized somewhat differently, and the programs offered are locally determined. The federal government is a direct participant in the first three efforts and has provided funding for the Montgomery County effort. You should have on your table uh, an uh, example of a strategy. Uh, this is the one that comes out of Minneapolis, St. Paul. It's a nice one-page example. There are other copies of this uh, outside, but I wanted to, to put it uh, forward just to give people an example uh, of, of the kinds of things that are happening here. While each of these uh, efforts uh, are occurring in important communities. The geographic coverage is still limited, raising the question of whether this kind of an effort is scalable. And if so, 
how would it be accomplished. Um, I do believe that this is scalable, and I have uh, four examples of how uh, this uh, can occur and, in fact, is occurring. The first is that the Department of Justice has tasked the U.S. attorneys around this country to add countering violent extremism as one of their major uh, tasks. Um, and this represents certainly uh, a, a avenue uh, for expanding this effort, although it is important, as I have said earlier, that this not be seen as solely a law enforcement uh, effort, or we will not get the people who may observe this to necessarily provide that information to people who can do something uh, about it. Secondly, uh, there are a number of national professional groups who have elements in local communities who can promote and provide information uh, to their own local institutions. Examples are the U.S. Conference of Mayors, the Association of American Colleges and Universities, the American Association of Community Colleges, the National Association of Social Workers, and various medical and mental health associations and, re and national religious groups. Uh, these, uh, I, I think, represent the vertical organization to the horizontal community effort that has to occur uh, in cities and towns around the country. Third, uh, there are on some occasions locally motivated individuals who see the problem and are willing to mobilize that effort, and Montgomery County is an example uh, of that, where a woman, Hedea Miramati, has basically pushed Montgomery County uh, into uh, creating uh, this effort. Uh, uh, here locally. Uh, others can also become catalysts uh, uh, in their own local communities. And finally, conferences, networks, and research like today's event uh, can also spread uh, that kind uh, of word around in order to, that these kinds of efforts uh, can be organized. Beyond local, the commun local community intervention effort, uh, I'd like to mention two other elements that I think are critical. Uh, first is a counter-narrative campaign, and second is international uh, information sharing uh, and uh, collaboration. Al-Qaeda, uh, for some time, and ISIS uh, more recently, have become very adept at creating a narrative using various social media platforms to push their brand of jihad in an appealing fashion, especially to young people. Governments on the other hand, have been slow and ill-equipped to respond, and their efforts have generally been ineffective. As a result, here in this country, the government, uh, including at the White House summit that I mentioned, is reaching out uh, to the private sector uh, to find credible messengers and message crafters and IT innovators to contest this digital space uh, that al-Qaeda and ISIS are currently occupied. While Washington, while the government here can convene and connect participants, the content of this counter-narrative has to be authentic from people like disillusioned ISIS members or charismatic, charismatic but not government-affiliated imams. It also has to be appealing and fast-moving. And the government, this government, or any government cannot be the messenger and cannot be seen in any way as controlling the message if this effort is to prove effective. Finally, I want to mention the international effort. Radicalization obviously is not unique to the United States. Recognizing that other countries in the Middle East, in North Africa, in Western Europe, have in many ways experienced far greater challenges in this area than we have. The U.S. and others have been working together on, an under, on understanding this issue and developing strategies. At the United Nations, specifically with U.N. Security Council Resolution 2178 and the follow-on work that it called for, at the Ministerial Meeting on Information Sharing held by the State Department in conjunction with the White House Summit, in February, in various meetings of the Global Counterterrorism Forum, in its ongoing research efforts, in meetings with the EU and EU member states, and with a number of other countries in bilateral meetings. One major effort uh, in this area uh, is information sharing uh, to identify 
those who have gone to uh, the conflict areas and who may return, and also to prevent uh, those uh, uh, who, who uh, might wish to go. While the United States is obviously interested in its own citizens and permanent resident non-citizens who might represent th threats domestically in this regard, this is an international effort which requires international cooperation to prevent currently active conflicts and terrorist acts from spreading to other countries. Moreover, with respect to Western Europe in particular, EU radicalized citizens are also a major concern here in this country because of their freedom to travel here uh, without visas. With that in mind, a number of senior U.S. officials have met with their counterparts in Europe, in Turkey, and in other areas in the Middle East and North Africa on numerous occasions to coordinate efforts on information sharing and open source data collection, particularly regarding travel information. In fact, I personally have involved, been involved in well over a dozen meetings over the last three years uh, in this regard. And while progress is being made, I also think it's fair to say uh, that it is uh, still slow um, and, and needs uh, more effort. In summary, violent extremism is not just an over there problem, it's a here problem here in the United States and in other countries as well. Law enforcement is and can be a critical part of the solution, but it needs to be part of a much broader community-based intervention effort supported by social science research and thoughtful, authentic counter-narrative message, messaging. And national efforts cannot occur uh, in isolation. This is a global problem. It requires a global effort. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Beers, for that comprehensive but also very detailed view of uh, U.S. approaches to uh, CVE. Um, let's uh, move on to uh, Dr. Gunul Toll. Uh, Dr. Gunul has led the effort at the Middle East Institute uh, with regard to this project. She also is the director of our Center for Turkish Studies. Uh, Gunul, the floor is yours. Thank you, Paul. And um, once again, on behalf of the Middle East Institute and our co-host, the Foundation for Strategic Research, I would like to welcome you all uh, to our conference. We uh, aim to, uh, to compare and assess the guiding principles and policies of the European Union and the United States with regard to preventing the advance of radicalized violent groups. Uh, as my colleague Paul just mentioned, the conference builds upon a workshop held in France in 2014 uh, by Dr. Jean-Luc Marais uh, that identified the gaps between the U.S. and European approaches to handling uh, destructive subculture in individuals and radical populations. Um, through the initiation of dialogue and examination of case studies, we hope in this conference to identify the challenges and best practices for uh, vi subduing violent radical groups and also to contribute to a productive dialogue between the US, uh, the European Union, and also the Arab world, uh, policy experts and, and practitioners. We have, great, we have three great panels uh, today and, and wonderful uh, panelists who will be addressing several uh, interesting issues. The title of, of the first panel is Why Do People Turn to Extremism? Uh, without further ado, I would like to ask uh, the panelists uh, of the, the first panel to kindly come to the podium so, uh, so that we can start. Uh, once again, thank you, and I hope you enjoy the discussion today.